Good morning. Look at me, I'm all refreshed from vacation. It was awesome. We have, um, <clears throat> we have a friend who uh, donates or allows us to use his cottage once a year and um, it, it uh, has a generator now to pump water, but it has no lights. And uh, so about 6.30, 7 o'clock at night, you, you read by the, the lantern, and then after a while, you just kind of get tired of that, and you go, oh, it must be late, I'm going to bed. And you lay in bed, and you look at your cell phone and see what time it is, and it's like 7.30. <laughs> and uh, so I had long sleeps, and uh, as did Henry, and we just feel really refreshed. So I, th I thank you for that space um, that you give me to, uh, to have vacation and to... Rest. I, I think I, I slept about 14 hours for the first three days every night. So, um, yeah, there was no reason to get out of bed, which was actually kind of a good feeling. But the weather was fantastic, and the colors up north, at least when we were there, just astounding. And uh, so we, we, I heard you had rain, <laughs> which is, uh, anyways. And our, our colors aren't coming on too well this year. We're kind of going green to yellow and uh, gone. So anyways, that was wonderful. As we come to worship, Jesus invites each of us, come all of you who are thirsty. You who long for the water of life, come and drink and God will lead you to quiet waters and he will refresh your soul. Dip your soul in the river of God's goodness. Quench your thirst in God's grace. He will lead you by quiet waters. And he will refresh your soul. Come. For God is here among us, offering the living water to all who come and believe. God will lead you to quiet waters and he will refresh your soul. This is why we have come to worship this morning. Let's pray. Living water, Christ, our Lord and our Savior, we come to you this morning thirsty, hungry, seeking for you to quench the deepest needs of our souls. We thank you that you call us afresh every day. We thank you that our thirst needs to be quenched every day. And this morning we recognize, O oh God, that you alone are the one who can quench it. You alone are the one whose living water can pour over us and wash away all of our brokenness, wash away our sin, you even wash away the evil in this world. And so we receive that cleansing today and we thank you that you have quenched our hunger and our thirst so deeply this morning. We pray, Father, that as we continue to worship you, as we continue to live our lives for you, that you would pour out more of your Holy Spirit upon us, and that more of your Holy Spirit might be recognized and enlightened within us. We thank you that you call us your people, and we praise you because you are our God. In Jesus' name, amen. When we have um, offerings, we begin our worship as we come through the doors. We've, we come reflecting on a week behind us of all the gifts that we have shared with others, for lovely cards received, thank you, for those gifts of phone calls, for the gifts of finances that have enabled us to redo our sanctuary, for the gifts that we give every day. 
our mission and outreach team is, is um, or that budget is, is just part of our regular giving. But every now and then we like to just highlight a couple of things. And so at this time of year, we'd like to recall uh, the food bank here in Glanbrook. And so donations will be received over the next couple of months for the food bank. And I hope by next week to have a reply from Vivian as to what their greatest needs are at this time. And also, um, Nicole, Nicola uh, Thompson, we've had her uh, at Coffee Chat a couple of times, and she shared with us a small ministry that she's founded called Advance Haiti. And basically what she does is she collects items from people like us, and she packs them all into a suitcase, and she goes and she does helps people start micro businesses off their front porch. So she'll do things like having a used clothing store off her front porch or off their front porch, which gives them money for schooling, gives them money for food and so on. And so uh, we're also just going to give some of those donations to Nicola this year, and, um, but monetary donations. We aren't collecting clothes or that kind of thing. So as, as we worship God, we do so also in our giving. And so as you um, think about that in your, in your financial gifts over the next couple of months, and also your, um, your physical gifts with uh, food donations, then uh, know that, that we're reaching out in Christ's name to those who need it most. <clears throat> Normally, we would sing a song <clears throat> right about now. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm very thirsty. <clears throat> I don't mean to be rude. <laughs> Actually, I'm, I'm very, very thirsty. <clears throat> I'm sure you know that our bodies are two-thirds percent water. <clears throat> when you reach the age of 70, you, your, your body will have required one and a half million gallons of water. <clears throat> Some of you are on to two million maybe, I don't know. <laughs> I feel like I might be. That's a lot of bathroom trips, just saying. <clears throat> if you lose 2% of your body's water supply, you actually feel very fatigued and lethargic. It takes, it takes a lot of your energy uh, by about 20%. And if you have a decrease of 10% of water in your body, you will actually be unable to walk. That's remarkable, isn't it? If you are at 20%, of which <clears throat> I feel like I'm very close to right now, um, you're dead, sadly. You know, when, when I had my first child, I, I really wanted to feed my children myself. And he would cry, and I would feed him, and he would go to, you know, back to bed or be content or whatever. But then I took him to the doctor, and they weighed him, and his weight had actually gone down rather than up. And the doctor said, your son has failure to thrive. Even though I was feeding him and he was full, my milk did not have the nourishment that his body needed. The question we want to consider this morning, and maybe every day of our life, is are you thirsty? Is your soul thriving? I surprised myself uh, this week in that I returned to Jeremiah. I, I know, I said I was done with Jeremiah last week. Um, but it's interesting because one of the first prophecies the Lord gives to Jeremiah in chapter 2, verse 13 says this. My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and they have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. You see, although Israel was, was practicing the religious rituals and they were coming together for weekly communal Sabbath worships, they were moving further and further away from their worship being focused on Yahweh. The worship was routine religious rituals, 
And, and throughout Jeremiah, the Lord talks about these things. And, and here the Lord says, you're drinking stagnant cistern water. Water that's just been sitting there. Water that has no fresh flow like my streams of living water. And, and these dead cisterns are, are the gods around them from other cultures made of wood and stone crafted by their own hands and they've left the people empty. A.K.A. Israel has a failure to thrive. And they've been backsliding ever so slowly. And we see this in the development of the feast days and there's, there's different points throughout Jeremiah in in which the Lord points us out to the people. And and one of these feast days is called the Feast of Tabernacles, or the Festival of the Booths. And it was an ordinance by the Lord where he said, all the men of Israel are to come into Jerusalem on this particular day, once a year, or for this week, and for seven days you are to live in tents, or booths, little huts, to remind them and for them to reflect on their exile from Egypt. And as they do so, they would recall that their four parents had no food and the Lord brought manna. Had no water and the Lord gave them this fresh source spring from the rock. They were to reflect on how Yahweh was their source and their dependence for everything in order to thrive. And the festival also had a deep emphasis on the coming Messiah for salvation. And many sacrifices were offered, like the drink offering. And so on the final day, the Sabbath day, the greatest day of the feast, they would sacrifice, well, they sacrifice lambs every day, but on this particular day, they would sacrifice lambs, and then the priests would pour wine over the altar, and it would create a fragrant offering of thanksgiving and praise to the Lord. Now, over time, things change. Rituals change. Traditions change. And so the, and they're also influenced by the world of their day, the different cultures, the gods, the, the, the societal way of doing things. And so eventually it got to a point where this new ritual developed in which the priests would lead the people from the, tri- from the temple and, and they would go off and, and go north through the temple to the pool of Siloam and they would pick up jugs of water. And they would bring it back to the temple, shouting and praising and hooping it up. And they would pour the water over the offerings. Not so fragrant anymore. And then at one point, a high priest, Janus, uh, we learn this from what they call extra curricular, extra what, outside of Bible history. We read of a high priest who who did this and, and they took the water and they came and he poured the water on the ground. And this became a new tradition. Now see, that, that, that doesn't sound so bad, right? I mean, not much has changed. They're still practicing their rituals. The problem was that the Egyptians would do this. And they would take these libations of water and pour them on the ground, not to praise, not to honor living, but to honor the dead. The very festival that was called by God for rejoicing, praise, and reflection as God being the source of life has now been watered down, literally, Were the Israelites spiritual? Yep. Did they practice all their religious rites and religious sacrifices? Check. Did they offer prayers? Did they do good things? Were they good people? You betcha. 
Were they nourished? Were their souls thriving? Buzzer. Failure to thrive. What's so interesting is that in the Gospel of John, John refers to this particular festival. In John chapter 7, Jesus has just arrived in Jerusalem, and the Jews are wholly engaged in this ritual of marching with their jugs of water and shouting and moving back into the temple. And then John records this. On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood up and said in a loud voice, and and the Greek there is, he screamed above the noise of the crowd, Hey! Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow through them. Can you imagine the dead silence that fell on that temple? What on earth was this miracle worker talking about? But the Jews knew. They knew the reference that Jesus was pointing to. That's why they were there. The provider of living water for all who thirsted was God, Yahweh, in the desert. That's what they were there to reflect on. They knew what Jesus was saying. They are confronted by their own history in that moment. What are we doing at this festival today? What's all this religious practice we're doing? Where's the meaning in it? I kind of lost sight of it. Are we really submitting to the living source of water? as we pour our libations on the ground to be sucked up, offered to the dead? We're so thirsty, they might come to realize. We feel so weak. Our souls are dying. This this festival, this party is not satisfying our deepest needs. This morning we're going to gather around the table of our Lord Jesus Christ. And today, particularly, we're going to hear the invitation of Jesus, Come, all of you who are thirsty. A question we should hear every day. Believe in Christ and your life will overflow. Granted, this is a religious ritual. A tradition. It, it, it may have become so familiar, so routine to us that sometimes we might find ourselves leaving the table undernourished. We might have forgotten the representation of the bread as Christ's body broken for us and for the world. We might have forgotten that the wine represents his blood shed for us and for the world. When you come to the table, you're going to be asked to take, eat, drink, remember, believe, and let Jesus satisfy that deep spiritual thirst. And maybe we want to consider what religious garbage or actions or leaky cisterns we've been living in for the week. Those things that are devoid of true worship, those things that we seek after or busy ourselves with that we do not take time to sit with God. That we do not take time to realize our dependence is not on how much we work or how busy we are or the things that we are caring for, but our dependence is on Jesus Christ, our life giver. Let us not come to the table out of tradition, out of, hey, this is a good thing to do. 
Let us come thirsty for Jesus Christ. To truly thirst for Jesus is to know that he is the only one in all of creation who can satisfy our deepest needs. And, and, and John Calvin picked up on this. The whole foundation of his institutes, this big fat book that I had to read in seminary, but, but one of the foundations, John Calvin's introduction, he says, Jesus Christ is the fountain of all good. And as he unfolds in his institutes, we read that it is the fountain that satisfies our spiritual thirst, even our physical thirst. A fountain that nourishes, a fountain that cleanses, that, that washes away the brokenness of the world. A fountain that brings justice and a fountain that pours out the Holy Spirit upon us and within us and gives all people life-giving grace. And this overflowing torrent of grace alone can satisfy because there's nothing we can do to meet that need ourselves. And not only so, for those who believe and for those whose primary source is Jesus Christ, those life-giving torrents, that fountain of grace pours out into others. It just happens. Because who can stop water? We were up north. And when we got to the cottage, there's, there's a bit of a hill. And I mean, it's, it's one of those roads where I hope our car will make it. Like, it really needs a four-by-four. I'm going up there in a Venza. Granted, it's a four-wheel drive, thank goodness. But when we got there, the water had washed out a big chunk of the road, a two-foot hole in the middle of the road, just wiped right out. And we kind of looked at it and went, and it's a long way to carry our stuff to the cottage yet. And so I got out of the car, and I stood there, and and I'd say to Henry, okay, steer a little to the right, because we had just enough room. Thank goodness we took the the Venza, not the other car, um, because it actually has a wider wheelbase. And very carefully we went up. But the, the problem was that there's a ditch along, but trees had fallen into it. And the water couldn't get through the normal way. But, but a flood, a fountain, a gushing of water will always find a way to flow. And so it found the path of least resistance, which was down the driveway. For those of you who are in Jesus Christ, that torrent of water will find the path of least resistance and flow through you. It's amazing. So amazing. And so we become these streams of living water by which God brings his love, faith, grace, salvation, goodness, kindness, justice, all of those things. And so as we gather around the table, it's true. It'll be a religious practice We'll go through a liturgy of communion, reciting the Apostles' Creed, saying the Lord's Prayer. We'll hear again those very familiar words, remember and believe. A practice that engages our body, our minds, and our spirits with the physicality of bread and juice and wine. Christ is our fountain of all good, upon whom We are wholly dependent. At St. Paul's this morning, they welcomed some new members. And they had come from other faith traditions and had moved into the area, and so they wanted to join a local community, recognizing the importance of being with the body of Jesus Christ. But we, we asked them some questions about reaffirming their faith. And so I'm just going to ask you to consider these questions afresh and to consider how thirsty you might be as you come to the table. Do you believe in God who creates, redeems, and sustains the world? Do you affirm Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and the Holy Spirit, your sanctifier, your cleanser? 
Will you seek to be Jesus' disciple and follow his teaching and example, welcoming those on the margins, speaking out against injustice, and showing God's love wherever you are able? And will you continue to be a faithful member or adherent of a local congregation, sharing in its worship, its ministry, through your presence, your prayers, your study, your service, your gifts of time, talent, and treasure, and so fulfill your calling to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, that you may pour out streams of living water on all people, empowered by the grace of Jesus Christ. Come, all you who are thirsty, to the table of our Lord. Today, as we celebrate communion, we join with millions around the world who call on the name of Jesus Christ and who have throughout many ages, from Old Testament festivals to the remaking of the table with Jesus Christ and his 12 disciples, we join all of them. When we do this, we take part in a story that tells us we are loved completely and unconditionally by God. And when we do this, we remember that Jesus invites us to this ancient but always new meal to share the feast and remember God's love. You are welcome to this celebration of grace. I ask you to respond, we come, as I point to you. All who are thirsty, God is the fountain of our lives. All who are hungry, God feeds us with goodness and grace. Rich and poor, young and old, neighbor and guest, we come. The Holy Spirit gathers us around the table. Let's pray. Our gracious God, we recognize that we try to distance ourselves from you. Loving God, you have spread this picnic of grace, waving us over with a big grin on your face. We whisper our worries in the night, and Lord, you say, you don't have to shout. Your compassion is spread over our brokenness like we spread peanut butter on toast. When we are tempted to spend our lives on all the luxuries offered to us by the world, God of the hungry, you set up a table piled high with grace, hope, peace, and joy. And wonder under a big sign which reads, clearance, everything, 100% off. And when we get all in a sweat over whether or not we can meet our own self-imposed expectations, you hand us a cup of cold water whispering, relax, I've taken all that off your shoulders. We rejoice in your gifts, which are ours. God and community, holy one. And so we lift up our voices with those around the world as we pray as Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. In the Bible, we read many, many stories of how Jesus gathered together with friends and with others from the highways and the byways around a meal. 
that on the night that Jesus was arrested, the night before he died, he gathered with his closest friends. And as they ate and they drank together, they had no idea what was coming later that night. Jesus interrupted everyone a moment. And he took the bread and he said, This bread is like my body. It will be broken and I will suffer. I am doing this for you. I am doing this for everyone. Then he took a cup of wine from the table and he said, This wine is like my blood poured out. And I am doing this for you. And I am doing this for everyone. In the Bible, we read that we should share the bread and the wine just like Jesus did with his friends that night so that we might remember Jesus' love for all people everywhere. And so that we might remember who it is that feeds and quenches our deepest needs. So just as Jesus did, we take this bread and this wine to be used for holy use. A new meal today. And we remember his good news for us. And before Jesus gave the bread to his friends to eat, he said a prayer. And his disciples responded. And when we come to the table, we do follow some ritual. We follow a call in response. And so I ask you to join me. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Loving God, we praise you. You are the one who brings hope and the promise of peace in Jesus Christ, your Son. Let us join with those around the world who confess Jesus Christ as their Lord by reciting the Apostles' Creed, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. The third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Lord Jesus, you open wide your arms to welcome us so that we might be drawn into your life and in so doing find fullness. Thank you for what you have taught us about your love, which is spacious and freely offered to all. May these everyday things of bread and wine be for us the presence of your spirit, that they may become for us the gift of your body, healing, forgiving, making us whole, so that we in turn may become for you your body, loving and caring in the world. In Jesus' name, amen. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Take, eat, remember and believe his body broken for you.
know that you will never be spiritually hungry again. When he took the cup, Jesus reminds us this is a new relationship with God. Made possible because of my death. Drink it, remember, and I will quench your spiritual thirst. Loving God, you are full of compassion. And we thank you that you have nourished us with the bread of life and with the wine of hope. Your love flowed out through Christ to all those around him. And so now let your love flow through us. You showed us your broken life in the cross and now brought to resurrection and newness. Let your life meet us in our brokenness and pain. Release hope in us and others through Jesus, the one who brings hope, peace, joy, and love to the world. Thanks be to God. And Holy Spirit, call us to always thirst after you so that you might lead us beside quiet waters and refresh our souls. Through Christ our good shepherd we pray. Amen. People of God, please stand, receive a charge from your God and his blessing. Go now and find the hungry and share your abundance to feed them. Go now and find the thirsty and show them where the living water flows. Go now to find the stranger and embrace them as your brother and sister. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit be with you always. Amen.